Adolf Hitler, Wikipedia article audio. Adolf Hitler, 20 April 1889 April 30, 1945 was a German politician who was the leader of the Nazi Party, Chancellor of Germany from 1933 to 1945 and Führer of Nazi Germany from 1934 to 1945. As dictator, Hitler initiated World War II in Europe with the invasion of Poland in September 1939, and was central to the Holocaust. Hitler was born in Austria then part of Austria-Hungary and was raised near Linz. He moved to Germany in 1913 and was decorated during his service in the German army in World War I. In 1919, he joined the German Workers' Party, the precursor of the Ensdap, and was appointed leader of the Ensdap in 1921. In 1923, he attempted to seize power in a failed coup in Munich and was imprisoned. While in jail he dictated the first volume of his autobiography and political manifesto Mein Kampf. After his release from prison in 1924, Hitler gained popular support by attacking the Treaty of Versailles and promoting pan-Germanism, anti-Semitism and anti-communism with charismatic oratory and Nazi propaganda. He frequently denounced international capitalism and communism as being part of a Jewish conspiracy. Early Years Ancestry By 1933, the Nazi party was the largest elected party in the German Reichstag, but did not have a majority, and no party was able to form a majority parliamentary coalition in support of a candidate for chancellor. This led to former Chancellor Franz von Papen and other conservative leaders persuading President Paul von Hindenburg to appoint Hitler as chancellor on January 30, 1933. Shortly after, the Reichstag passed the Enabling Act of 1933, which began the process of transforming the Weimar Republic into Nazi Germany, a one-party dictatorship based on the totalitarian and autocratic ideology of National Socialism. Hitler aimed to eliminate Jews from Germany and establish a new order to counter what he saw as the injustice of the post-World War I international order dominated by Britain and France. His first six years in power resulted in rapid economic recovery from the Great Depression, the abrogation of restrictions imposed on Germany after World War I and the annexation of territories that were home to millions of ethnic Germans which gave him significant popular support. Hitler sought Lebensraum for the German people in Eastern Europe and his aggressive foreign policy is considered to be the primary cause of the outbreak of World War II in Europe. He directed large-scale rearmament and on September 1, 1939 invaded Poland, resulting in Britain and France declaring war on Germany. In June 1941, Hitler ordered an invasion of the Soviet Union. By the end of 1941, German forces and the European Axis powers occupied most of Europe and North Africa. In December 1941, he formally declared war on the United States, bringing them directly into the conflict. Failure to defeat the Soviets and the entry of the United States into the war forced Germany onto the defensive and it suffered a series of escalating defeats. In the final days of the war during the Battle of Berlin in 1945, he married his longtime lover Eva Braun. Less than two days later on April 30, 1945, the two committed suicide to avoid capture by the Soviet Red Army and their corpses were burned. Under Hitler's leadership and racially motivated ideology, the Nazi regime was responsible for the genocide of at least 5.5 million Jews and millions of other victims whom he and his followers deemed untermention or socially undesirable. 
Hitler and the Nazi regime were also responsible for the killing of an estimated 19.3 million civilians and prisoners of war. In addition, 29 million soldiers and civilians died as a result of military action in the European theater. The number of civilians killed during the Second World War was unprecedented in warfare and the casualties constituted the deadliest conflict in human history. Hitler's father Alois Hitler Sr. was the illegitimate child of Maria Anna Skickelgruber. The baptismal register did not show the name of his father, and Alois initially bore his mother's surname Skickelgruber. In 1842, Johann George Heidler married Alois's mother Maria Anna. Alois was brought up in the family of Heidler's brother, Johann Nepomuk Heidler. In 1876, Alois was legitimated and the baptismal register changed by a priest to register Johann George Heidler as Alois's father. Alois then assumed the surname Hitler, also spelled Heidler, Hutler, or Hutler. The Hitler surname is probably based on one who lives in a hut. Nazi official Hans Frank suggested that Alois's mother had been employed as a housekeeper by a Jewish family in Graz, and that the family's 19-year-old son Leopold Frankenberger had fathered Alois. No Frankenberger was registered in Graz during that period, and no record has been produced of Leopold Frankenberger's existence, so historians dismiss the claim that Alois's father was Jewish. Childhood and Education Adolf Hitler was born on April 20, 1889 in Braunau Inn, a town in Austria-Hungary, close to the border with the German Empire. He was christened as Adolphus Hitler. He was the fourth of six children born to Alois Hitler and his third wife, Clara Paulslow. Three of Hitler's siblings Gustav, Ida, and Otto died in infancy. Also living in the household were Alois's children from his second marriage, Alois Jr. and Angela. When Hitler was three, the family moved to Passau, Germany. There he acquired the distinctive Lower Bavarian dialect, rather than Austrian German, which marked his speech throughout his life. The family returned to Austria and settled in Leonding in 1894, and in June 1895 Alois retired to Hayfield, near Lambach, where he farmed and kept bees. Hitler attended Volksschule in nearby Fischlam. The move to Hayfield coincided with the onset of intense father-son conflicts caused by Hitler's refusal to conform to the strict discipline of his school. Alois Hitler's farming efforts at Hayfield ended in failure, and in 1897 the family moved to Lambach. The eight-year-old Hitler took singing lessons, sang in the church choir, and even considered becoming a priest. In 1898 the family returned permanently to Leon Ding. Hitler was deeply affected by the death of his younger brother Edmund who died in 1900 from measles. Hitler changed from a confident, outgoing, conscientious student to a morose, detached boy who constantly fought with his father and teachers. Early Adulthood in Vienna and Munich Alois had made a successful career in the Customs Bureau, and wanted his son to follow in his footsteps. Hitler later dramatized an episode from this period when his father took him to visit a customs office, depicting it as an event that gave rise to an unforgiving antagonism between father and son, who were both strong-willed. Ignoring his son's desire to attend a classical high school and become an artist, Alois sent Hitler to the real Schule in Linz in September 1900. Hitler rebelled against this decision, and in Mein Kampf states that he intentionally did poorly in school, 
hoping that once his father saw what little progress I was making at the technical school he would let me devote myself to my dream. Like many Austrian Germans, Hitler began to develop German nationalist ideas from a young age. He expressed loyalty only to Germany, despising the declining Habsburg monarchy and its rule over an ethnically variegated empire. Hitler and his friends used the greeting Heil, and sang the Deutsche Landlied instead of the Austrian imperial anthem. After a Luisa's sudden death on January 3, 1903, Hitler's performance at school deteriorated and his mother allowed him to leave. He enrolled at the Real Schule in Stare in September 1904, where his behavior and performance improved. In 1905, after passing a repeat of the final exam, Hitler left the school without any ambitions for further education or clear plans for a career. World War I in 1907 Hitler left Linz to live and study fine art in Vienna, financed by orphans' benefits and support from his mother. He applied for admission to the Academy of Fine Arts Vienna but was rejected twice. The director explained his drawings showed unfitness for painting and suggested Hitler was better suited to studying architecture. Though this was an interest of his, he lacked the academic credentials as he had not finished secondary school. On December 21, 1907, his mother died of breast cancer at the age of 47. In 1909 Hitler ran out of money and was forced to live a bohemian life in homeless shelters and a men's hostel. He earned money as a casual laborer and by painting and selling watercolors of Vienna's sites. Entry into Politics During his time in Vienna he pursued a growing passion for two interests, architecture and music, attending ten performances of Lohengrin, his favorite Wagner opera. Beer Hall Putsch in Landsberg Prison It was here that Hitler first became exposed to racist rhetoric. Populists such as Mayor Karl Lueger exploited the climate of virulent anti-Semitism and occasionally espoused German nationalist notions for political effect. German nationalism had a particularly widespread following in the Maria Hilf district, where Hitler lived. George Ritter von Schönerer became a major influence on Hitler. He also developed an admiration for Martin Luther. Hitler read local newspapers such as Deutsches Volksblatt that fanned prejudice and played on Christian fears of being swamped by an influx of Eastern European Jews. He read newspapers and pamphlets that published the thoughts of philosophers and theoreticians such as Houston Stuart Chamberlain, Charles Darwin, Friedrich Nietzsche, Gustav L. E. Bonn and Arthur Schopenhauer. The origin and development of Hitler's anti-Semitism remains a matter of debate. His friend, August Kubizek, claimed that Hitler was a confirmed anti-Semite before he left Linz. However, historian Bridget Heyman describes Kubizek's claim as problematical. While Hitler states in Mein Kampf that he first became an anti-Semite in Vienna, Reinhold Hanisch, who helped him sell his paintings, disagrees. Hitler had dealings with Jews while living in Vienna. Historian Richard J. Evans states that historians now generally agree that his notorious, murderous anti-Semitism emerged well after Germany's defeat, as a product of the paranoid stab-in-the-back explanation for the catastrophe. Rebuilding the Enstab Hitler received the final part of his father's estate in May 1913 and moved to Munich, Germany. Hitler was called up for conscription into the Austro-Hungarian army, so he journeyed to Salzburg on February 5, 1914 for medical assessment. After he was deemed by the medical examiners as unfit for service, he returned to Munich. 
Hitler later claimed that he did not wish to serve the Habsburg Empire because of the mixture of races in its army and his belief that the collapse of Austria-Hungary was imminent. In August 1914, at the outbreak of World War I, Hitler was living in Munich and voluntarily enlisted in the Bavarian Army. According to a 1924 report by the Bavarian authorities, allowing Hitler to serve was almost certainly an administrative error, since as an Austrian citizen, he should have been returned to Austria. Posted to the Bavarian Reserve Infantry Regiment 16, he served as a dispatch runner on the Western Front in France and Belgium, spending nearly half his time at the regimental headquarters in Forns and Webs, well behind the front lines. He was present at the First Battle of Ypres, the Battle of the Somme, the Battle of Arras, and the Battle of Passchendaele, and was wounded at the Somme. He was decorated for bravery, receiving the Iron Cross, second class, in 1914. On a recommendation by Lt. Hugo Gutmann, Hitler's Jewish superior, he received the Iron Cross, first class on August 4, 1918, a decoration rarely awarded to one of Hitler's Gefreiter rank. He received the Black Wound Badge on May 18, 1918. During his service at headquarters, Hitler pursued his artwork, drawing cartoons, and instructions for an army newspaper. During the Battle of the Somme in October 1916, he was wounded in the left thigh when a shell exploded in the dispatch runner's dugout. Hitler spent almost two months in hospital at Bielitz, returning to his regiment on March 5, 1917. On October 15, 1918, he was temporarily blinded in a mustard gas attack and was hospitalist in Pays Walk. While there, Hitler learned of Germany's defeat, and by his own account upon receiving this news, he suffered a second bout of blindness. Hitler described the war as the greatest of all experiences, and was praised by his commanding officers for his bravery. His wartime experience reinforced his German patriotism and he was shocked by Germany's capitulation in November 1918. His bitterness over the collapse of the war effort began to shape his ideology. Like other German nationalists, he believed the Dolchstoßlegend, which claimed that the German army, undefeated in the field, had been stabbed in the back on the home front by civilian leaders, Jews, and Marxists, later dubbed the November Criminals. The Treaty of Versailles stipulated that Germany must relinquish several of its territories and demilitarize the Rhineland. The treaty imposed economic sanctions and levied heavy reparations on the country. Many Germans saw the treaty as an unjust humiliation they especially objected to Article 231, which they interpreted as declaring Germany responsible for the war. The Versailles Treaty and the economic, social, and political conditions in Germany after the war were later exploited by Hitler for political gain. Rise to Power After World War I Hitler returned to Munich. Without formal education or career prospects, he remained in the army. In July 1919 he was appointed Verbindungsmann of an Aufklärungskommando of the Reichswehr, assigned to influence other soldiers and to infiltrate the German Workers' Party. At a DAP meeting on September 12, 1919, Party chairman Anton Drexler was impressed with Hitler's oratorical skills. He gave him a copy of his pamphlet My Political Awakening, which contained anti-Semitic, nationalist, anti-capitalist, and anti-Marxist ideas. On the orders of his army superiors, Hitler applied to join the party, and within a week was accepted as party member 555. Bruning administration. Around this time, 
Hitler made his earliest known recorded statement about the Jews in a letter dated September 16, 1919 to Adolf Gemlich about the Jewish question. In the letter, Hitler argues that the aim of the government must unshakably be the removal of the Jews altogether. At the DAP, Hitler met Dietrich Eckhart, one of the party's founders and a member of the Occult Thule Society. Eckhart became Hitler's mentor, exchanging ideas with him and introducing him to a wide range of Munich society. To increase its appeal, the DAP changed its name to the National Socialistische Deutsche Arbeiterpartei. Hitler designed the party's banner of a swastika in a white circle on a red background. Hitler was discharged from the army on March 31, 1920 and began working full-time for the NSDAP. The party headquarters was in Munich, a hotbed of anti-government German nationalists determined to crush Marxism and undermine the Weimar Republic. In February 1921 already highly effective at crowd manipulation he spoke to a crowd of over 6,000. To publicize the meeting, two truckloads of party supporters drove around Munich waving swastika flags and distributing leaflets. Hitler soon gained notoriety for his rowdy polemic speeches against the Treaty of Versailles, rival politicians, and especially against Marxists and Jews. In June 1921, while Hitler and Eckhart were on a fundraising trip to Berlin, a mutiny broke out within the NSDAP in Munich. Members of its executive committee wanted to merge with the rival German Socialist Party. Hitler returned to Munich on July 11 and angrily tendered his resignation. The committee members realized that the resignation of their leading public figure and speaker would mean the end of the party. Hitler announced he would rejoin on the condition that he would replace Drexler as party chairman, and that the party headquarters would remain in Munich. The committee agreed, and he rejoined the party on July 26 as member 3680. Hitler continued to face some opposition within the NSDAP. Opponents of Hitler in the leadership had Hermann Esser expelled from the party, and they printed 3,000 copies of a pamphlet attacking Hitler as a traitor to the party. In the following days, Hitler spoke to several packed houses and defended himself and Esser, to thunderous applause. His strategy proved successful and at a special party congress on July 29, he was granted absolute powers as party chairman, replacing Drexler, by a vote of 533 to 1. Appointment as Chancellor Reichstag fire and March elections Day of Potsdam and the Enabling Act Dictatorship Hitler's vitriolic beer hall speeches began attracting regular audiences. He became adept at using populist themes, including the use of scapegoats, who were blamed for his listeners' economic hardships. Hitler used personal magnetism and an understanding of crowd psychology to his advantage while engaged in public speaking. Historians have noted the hypnotic effect of his rhetoric on large audiences, and of his eyes in small groups. Algis Budreis recalled the crowd noise and behavior when Hitler appeared in a 1936 parade, some in the audience writhed and rolled on the ground or experienced fecal incontinence. Alphonse Heck, a former member of the Hitler Youth, recalled a similar experience. We erupted into a frenzy of nationalistic pride that bordered on hysteria. For minutes on end, we shouted at the top of our lungs, with tears streaming down our faces, Sieg Heil, Sieg Heil, Sieg Heil. From that moment on, I belonged to Adolf Hitler body and soul. Early followers included Rudolf Hess former Air Force ace Hermann Göring, and Army Captain Ernst Röhm. 
Rome became head of the Nazis' paramilitary organization, the Sturmabteilung, which protected meetings and attacked political opponents. A critical influence on Hitler's thinking during this period was the Aufbauvereinigung, a conspiratorial group of white Russian exiles and early National Socialists. The group, financed with funds channeled from wealthy industrialists, introduced Hitler to the idea of a Jewish conspiracy, linking international finance with Bolshevism. In 1923 Hitler enlisted the help of World War I General Erich Ludendorff for an attempted coup known as the Beer Hall Putsch. The Enstap used Italian fascism as a model for their appearance and policies. Hitler wanted to emulate Benito Mussolini's March on Rome of 1922 by staging his own coup in Bavaria, to be followed by a challenge to the government in Berlin. Hitler and Ludendorff sought the support of Staatskommissar Gustav Ritter von Kahr, Bavaria's de facto ruler. However, Kahr, along with police chief Hans Ritter von Caesar and Reichswehr General Otto von Lasso, wanted to install a nationalist dictatorship without Hitler. On November 8, 1923 Hitler and the SA stormed a public meeting of 3,000 people organized by Carr in the Burger Brockeller, a beer hall in Munich. Interrupting Carr's speech, he announced that the National Revolution had begun and declared the formation of a new government with Ludendorff. Retiring to a back room, Hitler, with handgun drawn, demanded and got the support of Carr, Caesar, and Lasso. Hitler's forces initially succeeded in occupying the local Reichswehr and police headquarters, but Carr and his cohorts quickly withdrew their support. Neither the army, nor the state police, joined forces with Hitler. The next day, Hitler and his followers marched from the Beer Hall to the Bavarian War Ministry to overthrow the Bavarian government, but police dispersed them. Sixteen Enstap members and four police officers were killed in the failed coup. Hitler fled to the home of Ernst Hanfste Engel and by some accounts contemplated suicide. He was depressed but calm when arrested on November 11, 1923 for high treason. His trial before the Special People's Court in Munich began in February 1924, and Alfred Rosenberg became temporary leader of the Enstap. On April 1, Hitler was sentenced to five years imprisonment at Landsberg Prison. There, he received friendly treatment from the guards and was allowed mail from supporters and regular visits by party comrades. Pardoned by the Bavarian Supreme Court, he was released from jail on December 20, 1924, against the state prosecutor's objections. Including time on remand, Hitler served just over one year in prison. While at Landsberg, Hitler dictated most of the first volume of Mein Kampf to his deputy, Rudolf Hess. The book, dedicated to Thule Society member Dietrich Eckhart, was an autobiography and exposition of his ideology. The book laid out Hitler's plans for transforming German society into one based on race. Some passages imply genocide. Published in two volumes in 1925 and 1926, it sold 228,000 copies between 1925 and 1932. One million copies were sold in 1933, Hitler's first year in office. Nazi Germany Shortly before Hitler was eligible for parole, the Bavarian government attempted to have him deported back to Austria. The Austrian Federal Chancellor rejected the request on the specious grounds that his service in the German army made his Austrian citizenship void. In response, Hitler formally renounced his Austrian citizenship on April 7, 1925. 
At the time of Hitler's release from prison, politics in Germany had become less combative and the economy had improved, limiting Hitler's opportunities for political agitation. As a result of the failed Beer Hall Putsch, the NSDAP and its affiliated organizations were banned in Bavaria. In a meeting with the Prime Minister of Bavaria Heinrich held on January 4, 1925, Hitler agreed to respect the state's authority and promised that he would seek political power only through the democratic process. The meeting paved the way for the ban on the NSDAP to be lifted on February 16. However, after an inflammatory speech he gave on February 27, Hitler was barred from public speaking by the Bavarian authorities, a ban that remained in place until 1927. To advance his political ambitions in spite of the ban, Hitler appointed Gregor Strasser, Otto Strasser and Joseph Goebbels to organize and grow the Ensdap in northern Germany. Gregor Strasser steered a more independent political course, emphasizing the socialist elements of the party's program. The stock market in the United States crashed on October 24, 1929. The impact in Germany was dire, millions were thrown out of work and several major banks collapsed. Hitler and the NSDAP prepared to take advantage of the emergency to gain support for their party. They promised to repudiate the Versailles Treaty, strengthen the economy and provide jobs. Economy and Culture Rearmament and New Alliances World War II The Great Depression provided a political opportunity for Hitler. Germans were ambivalent about the Parliamentary Republic, which faced challenges from right and left-wing extremists. The moderate political parties were increasingly unable to stem the tide of extremism, and the German referendum of 1929 helped to elevate Nazi ideology. The elections of September 1930 resulted in the breakup of a grand coalition and its replacement with a minority cabinet. Its leader, Chancellor Heinrich Brüning of the Center Party, governed through emergency decrees from President Paul von Hindenburg. Governance by decree became the new norm and paved the way for authoritarian forms of government. The NSDAP rose from obscurity to win 18.3% of the vote and 107 parliamentary seats in the 1930 election, becoming the second largest party in parliament. Hitler made a prominent appearance at the trial of two Reichswehr officers, Lieutenants Richard Schuringer and Hans Luden, in late 1930. Both were charged with membership in the NSDAP, at that time illegal for Reichswehr personnel. The prosecution argued that the NSDAP was an extremist party, prompting defense lawyer Hans Frank to call on Hitler to testify. On September 25, 1930, Hitler testified that his party would pursue political power solely through democratic elections, which won him many supporters in the officer corps. Brüning's austerity measures brought little economic improvement and were extremely unpopular. Hitler exploited this by targeting his political messages specifically at people who had been affected by the inflation of the 1920s and the Depression, such as farmers, war veterans, and the middle class. Although Hitler had terminated his Austrian citizenship in 1925, he did not acquire German citizenship for almost seven years. This meant that he was stateless legally unable to run for public office, and still faced the risk of deportation. On February 25, 1932, the Interior Minister of Brunswick, Dietrich Klags, who was a member of the NSDAP, appointed Hitler as administrator for the state's delegation to the Reichsrat in Berlin, making Hitler a citizen of Brunswick, and thus of Germany. 
Hitler ran against Hindenburg in the 1932 presidential elections. A January 27, 1932 speech to the industry club in Dusseldorf won him support from many of Germany's most powerful industrialists. Hindenburg had support from various nationalist, monarchist, Catholic, and Republican parties, and some social democrats. Hitler used the campaign slogan Hitler über Deutschland, a reference to his political ambitions and his campaigning by aircraft. He was one of the first politicians to use aircraft travel for political purposes, and used it effectively. Hitler came in second in both rounds of the election, garnering more than 35 percenter of the vote Indiana the final election. Although he lost to Hindenburg, this election established Hitler as a strong force in German politics. Early Diplomatic Successes The absence of an effective government prompted two influential politicians, Franz von Papen and Alfred Hugenberg, along with several other industrialists and businessmen, to write a letter to Hindenburg. The signers urged Hindenburg to appoint Hitler as leader of a government independent from parliamentary parties, which could turn into a movement that would enrapture millions of people. Hindenburg reluctantly agreed to appoint Hitler as chancellor after two further parliamentary elections in July and November 1932 had not resulted in the formation of a majority government. Hitler headed a short-lived coalition government formed by the Enstap and Hugenberg's party, the German National People's Party. On January 30, 1933, the new cabinet was sworn in during a brief ceremony in Hindenburg's office. The Enstap gained three posts, Hitler was named Chancellor, Wilhelm Frick Minister of the Interior, and Hermann Göring Minister of the Interior for Prussia. Hitler had insisted on the ministerial positions as a way to gain control over the police in much of Germany. As Chancellor, Hitler worked against attempts by the Enstap's opponents to build a majority government. Because of the political stalemate, he asked Hindenburg to again dissolve the Reichstag, and elections were scheduled for early March. On February 27, 1933, the Reichstag building was set on fire. Goring blamed a communist plot, because Dutch communist Marinus van der Lubbe was found in incriminating circumstances inside the burning building. According to Kershaw, the consensus of nearly all historians is that van der Lubbe actually set the fire. Others, including William L. Shire and Alan Bullock, are of the opinion that the Enstap itself was responsible. At Hitler's urging, Hindenburg responded with the Reichstag Fire Decree of February 28, which suspended basic rights and allowed detention without trial. The decree was permitted under Article 48 of the Weimar Constitution, which gave the president the power to take emergency measures to protect public safety and order. Activities of the German Communist Party were suppressed, and some 4,000 KPD members were arrested. In addition to political campaigning, the Enstap engaged in paramilitary violence and the spread of anti-communist propaganda in the days preceding the election. On election day, March 6, 1933, the Enstap's share of the vote increased to 43.9 percent, and the party acquired the largest number of seats in Parliament. Hitler's party failed to secure an absolute majority, necessitating another coalition with the DNVP. On March 21, 1933, the new Reichstag was constituted with an opening ceremony at the Garrison Church in Potsdam. This day of Potsdam was held to demonstrate unity between the Nazi movement and the old Prussian elite and military. Hitler appeared in a morning coat and humbly greeted Hindenburg.
to achieve full political control despite not having an absolute majority in parliament, Hitler's government brought the Ermach Tegungsgesetz to a vote in the newly elected Reichstag. The act officially titled the Gesetz zur Behebung der Not von Volk und Reich gave Hitler's cabinet the power to enact laws without the consent of the Reichstag for four years. These laws could deviate from the constitution. Since it would affect the constitution, the enabling act required a two-thirds majority to pass. Leaving nothing to chance, the Nazis used the provisions of the Reichstag fire decree to arrest all 81 communist deputies and prevent several social democrats from attending. On March 23, 1933, the Reichstag assembled at the Kroll Opera House under turbulent circumstances. Ranks of SA men served as guards inside the building, while large groups outside opposing the proposed legislation shouted slogans and threats towards the arriving members of parliament. The position of the Centre Party, the third largest party in the Reichstag, was decisive. After Hitler verbally promised party leader Ludwig Koss that Hindenburg would retain his power of veto, Koss announced the Centre Party would support the Enabling Act. The act passed by a vote of 44184, with all parties except the Social Democrats voting in favor. The Enabling Act, along with the Reichstag Fire Decree, transformed Hitler's government into a de facto legal dictatorship. At the risk of appearing to talk nonsense I tell you that the National Socialist Movement will go on for 1,000 years. Don't forget how people laughed at me 15 years ago when I declared that one day I would govern Germany. They laugh now, just as foolishly, when I declare that I shall remain in power. Having achieved full control over the legislative and executive branches of government, Hitler and his allies began to suppress the remaining opposition. The Social Democratic Party was banned and its assets seized. While many trade union delegates were in Berlin for May Day activities, SA stormtroopers demolished union offices around the country. On May 2, 1933 all trade unions were forced to dissolve and their leaders were arrested. Some were sent to concentration camps. The German Labour Front was formed as an umbrella organization to represent all workers, administrators and company owners, thus reflecting the concept of National Socialism in the spirit of Hitler's Volksgemeinschaft. By the end of June, the other parties had been intimidated into disbanding. This included the Nazis' nominal coalition partner, the DNVP, with the SA's help. Hitler forced its leader, Hugenberg, to resign on June 29. On July 14, 1933, the Ensdap was declared the only legal political party in Germany. The demands of the SA for more political and military power caused anxiety among military, industrial and political leaders. In response, Hitler purged the entire SA leadership in the Night of the Long Knives, which took place from June 30 to July 2, 1934. Hitler targeted Ernst Röhm and other SA leaders who, along with a number of Hitler's political adversaries, were rounded up, arrested, and shot. While the international community and some Germans were shocked by the murders, many in Germany believed Hitler was restoring order. Alliance with Japan Austria and Czechoslovakia On August 2, 1934, Hindenburg died. The previous day, the cabinet had enacted the law concerning the highest state office of the Reich. This law stated that upon Hindenburg's death, the office of president would be abolished and its powers merged with those of the chancellor. Hitler thus became head of state as well as head of government, and was formally named as Führer und Reichskanzler. 
With this action, Hitler eliminated the last legal remedy by which he could be removed from office. As head of state, Hitler became supreme commander of the armed forces. Immediately after Hindenburg's death, at the instigation of the leadership of the Reichswehr, the traditional loyalty oath of soldiers was altered to affirm loyalty to Hitler personally, by name, rather than to the office of supreme commander or the state. On August 19, the merger of the presidency with the chancellorship was approved by 88 per center of the electorate voting Indiana a plebiscite. Start of World War II In early 1938, Hitler used blackmail to consolidate his hold over the military by instigating the Blomberg Fritsch affair. Hitler forced his war minister, Field Marshal Werner von Blomberg, to resign by using a police dossier that showed that Blomberg's new wife had a record for prostitution. Army Commander Colonel General Werner von Fritsch was removed after the Schutzes Tafel produced allegations that he had engaged in a homosexual relationship. Both men had fallen into disfavor because they objected to Hitler's demand to make the Wehrmacht ready for war as early as 1938. Hitler assumed Blomberg's title of Commander-in-Chief, thus taking personal command of the armed forces. He replaced the Ministry of War with the Oberkommando der Wehrmacht, headed by General Wilhelm Keitel. On the same day, 16 generals were stripped of their commands and 44 more were transferred, all were suspected of not being sufficiently pro-Nazi. By early February 1938, 12 more generals had been removed. Path to Defeat Defeat and Death The Holocaust Leadership Style Legacy Views on Religion Health Family In Propaganda Films List of Propaganda and Film Appearances Notes Citations Hitler took care to give his dictatorship the appearance of legality. Many of his decrees were explicitly based on the Reichstag Fire Decree and hence on Article 48 of the Weimar Constitution. The Reichstag renewed the Enabling Act twice, each time for a four-year period. While elections to the Reichstag were still held, Voters were presented with a single list of Nazis and pro-Nazi guests which carried with well over 90% of the vote. These elections were held in far from secret conditions, the Nazis threatened severe reprisals against anyone who didn't vote or dared to vote no. In August 1934, Hitler appointed Reichsbank President Hjalmar Schacht as Minister of Economics, and in the following year, as plenipotentiary for war economy in charge of preparing the economy for war. Reconstruction and rearmament were financed through MEFO bills, printing money and seizing the assets of people arrested as enemies of the state, including Jews. Unemployment fell from 6 million in 1932 to 1 million in 1936. Hitler oversaw one of the largest infrastructure improvement campaigns in German history, leading to the construction of dams, autobahns, railroads, and other civil works. Wages were slightly lower in the mid to late 1930s compared with wages during the Weimar Republic, while the cost of living increased by 25 per center. The average work week increased during the shift to a war economy. By 1939, the average German was working between 47 and 50 hours a week. Hitler's government sponsored architecture on an immense scale. Albert Speer, instrumental in implementing Hitler's classicist reinterpretation of German culture, was placed in charge of the proposed architectural renovations of Berlin. Despite a threatened multi-nation boycott, 
Germany hosted the 1936 Olympic Games. Hitler officiated at the opening ceremonies and attended events at both the Winter Games in Garmisch-Partenkirchen and the Summer Games in Berlin. In a meeting with German military leaders on February 3, 1933, Hitler spoke of conquest for Lebensraum in the East and its ruthless Germanization as his ultimate foreign policy objectives. In March, Prince Bernhard Wilhelm von Bülow, secretary at the Auswärtiges AMT, issued a statement of major foreign policy aims, Anschluss with Austria, the restoration of Germany's national borders of 1914 rejection of military restrictions under the Treaty of Versailles, the return of the former German colonies in Africa, and a German zone of influence in Eastern Europe. Hitler found Bülow's goals to be too modest. In speeches during this period, he stressed the peaceful goals of his policies and a willingness to work within international agreements. At the first meeting of his cabinet in 1933, Hitler prioritized military spending over unemployment relief. Germany withdrew from the League of Nations and the World Disarmament Conference in October 1933. In January 1935, over 90% of the people of the Tsarland, then under League of Nations administration, voted to unite with Germany. That March, Hitler announced an expansion of the Wehrmacht to 600,000 members six times the number permitted by the Versailles Treaty including development of an air force and an increase in the size of the navy. Britain, France, Italy and the League of Nations condemned these violations of the treaty, but did nothing to stop it. The Anglo-German Naval Agreement of June 18 allowed German tonnage to increase to 35 per center of that of the British Navy. Hitler called the signing of the Agna the happiest day of his life, believing that the agreement marked the beginning of the Anglo-German alliance he had predicted in Main Kampf. France and Italy were not consulted before the signing directly undermining the League of Nations and setting the Treaty of Versailles on the path towards irrelevance. Germany reoccupied the demilitarized zone in the Rhineland in March 1936, in violation of the Versailles Treaty. Hitler also sent troops to Spain to support General Franco during the Spanish Civil War after receiving an appeal for help in July 1936. At the same time, Hitler continued his efforts to create an Anglo-German alliance. In August 1936, in response to a growing economic crisis caused by his rearmament efforts, Hitler ordered Göring to implement a four-year plan to prepare Germany for war within the next four years. The plan envisaged an all-out struggle between Judeo-Bolshevism and German National Socialism, which in Hitler's view required a committed effort of rearmament regardless of the economic costs. Count Gael Azzocano, foreign minister of Mussolini's government, declared an axis between Germany and Italy, and on November 25, Germany signed the Anti-Comintern Pact with Japan. Britain, China, Italy and Poland were also invited to join the Anti-Comintern Pact but only Italy signed in 1937. Hitler abandoned his plan of an Anglo-German alliance, blaming inadequate British leadership. At a meeting in the Reich Chancellery with his foreign ministers and military chiefs that November, Hitler restated his intention of acquiring Lebensraum for the German people. He ordered preparations for war in the East to begin as early as 1938 and no later than 1943. In the event of his death, the conference minutes, recorded as the Hasbach Memorandum, were to be regarded as his political testament. He felt that a severe decline in living standards in Germany as a result of the economic crisis could only be stopped by military aggression aimed at seizing Austria and Czechoslovakia. 
Hitler urged quick action before Britain and France gained a permanent lead in the arms race. In early 1938, in the wake of the Blomberg Fritsch affair, Hitler asserted control of the military foreign policy apparatus, dismissing Neurath as foreign minister and appointing himself as war minister. From early 1938 onwards, Hitler was carrying out a foreign policy ultimately aimed at war. In February 1938, on the advice of his newly appointed foreign minister, the strongly pro-Japanese Joachim von Ribbentrop, Hitler ended the Sino-German alliance with the Republic of China to instead enter into an alliance with the more modern and powerful Empire of Japan. Hitler announced German recognition of Manchu Kuo, the Japanese-occupied state in Manchuria, and renounced German claims to their former colonies in the Pacific held by Japan. Hitler ordered an end to arms shipments to China and recalled all German officers working with the Chinese army. In retaliation, Chinese General Chiang Kai-shek cancelled all Sino-German economic agreements, depriving the Germans of many Chinese raw materials. On March 12, 1938, Hitler announced the unification of Austria with Nazi Germany in the Anschluss. Hitler then turned his attention to the ethnic German population of the Sudetenland region of Czechoslovakia. On 28-29 March 1938, Hitler held a series of secret meetings in Berlin with Konrad Henlein of the Sudeten German Party, the largest of the ethnic German parties of the Sudetenland. The men agreed that Henlein would demand increased autonomy for Sudeten Germans from the Czechoslovakian government, thus providing a pretext for German military action against Czechoslovakia. In April 1938 Henlein told the Foreign Minister of Hungary that whatever the Czech government might offer, he would always raise still higher demands. He wanted to sabotage an understanding by any means because this was the only method to blow up Czechoslovakia quickly. In private, Hitler considered the Sudeten issue unimportant, his real intention was a war of conquest against Czechoslovakia. In April Hitler ordered the OKW to prepare for Fall Grun, the code name for an invasion of Czechoslovakia. As a result of intense French and British diplomatic pressure, on September 5 Czechoslovakian President Edvard Ben unveiled the fourth plan for constitutional reorganization of his country, which agreed to most of Henlein's demands for Sudeten autonomy. Henlein's party responded to Ben's offer by instigating a series of violent clashes with the Czechoslovakian police that led to the declaration of martial law in certain Sudeten districts. Germany was dependent on imported oil, a confrontation with Britain over the Czechoslovakian dispute could curtail Germany's oil supplies. This forced Hitler to call off Fall Grun originally planned for October 1, 1938. On September 29 Hitler, Neville Chamberlain, Edouard Dallottier, and Mussolini attended a one-day conference in Munich that led to the Munich Agreement, which handed over the Sudetenland districts to Germany. Chamberlain was satisfied with the Munich Conference, calling the outcome peace for our time while Hitler was angered about the missed opportunity for war in 1938, he expressed his disappointment in a speech on October 9 in Saarbrücken. In Hitler's view, the British brokered peace, although favorable to the ostensible German demands, was a diplomatic defeat which spurred his intent of limiting British power to pave the way for the eastern expansion of Germany. As a result of the summit, Hitler was selected Time Magazine's Man of the Year for 1938. In late 1938 and early 1939, the continuing economic crisis caused by rearmament forced Hitler to make major defense cuts. In his Export or Die speech of January 30, 1939, 
he called for an economic offensive to increase German foreign exchange holdings to pay for raw materials such as high-grade iron needed for military weapons. On March 15, 1939, in violation of the Munich Accord and possibly as a result of the deepening economic crisis requiring additional assets, Hitler ordered the Wehrmacht to invade Prague, and from Prague Castle he proclaimed Bohemia and Moravia a German protectorate. In private discussions in 1939, Hitler declared Britain the main enemy to be defeated and that Poland's obliteration was a necessary prelude for that goal. The eastern flank would be secured and land would be added to Germany's Lebensraum. Offended by the British guarantee on March 31, 1939 of Polish independence, he said, I shall brew them a devil's drink. In a speech in Wilhelmshaven for the launch of the battleship Tirpitz on April 1, he threatened to denounce the Anglo-German naval agreement if the British continued to guarantee Polish independence, which he perceived as an encirclement policy. Poland was to either become a German satellite state or it would be neutralized in order to secure the Reich's eastern flank and prevent a possible British blockade. Hitler initially favored the idea of a satellite state, but upon its rejection by the Polish government, he decided to invade and made this the main foreign policy goal of 1939. On April 3, Hitler ordered the military to prepare for Fall Weiss, the plan for invading Poland on August 25. In a Reichstag speech on April 28, he renounced both the Anglo-German Naval Agreement and the German-Polish Non-Aggression Pact. Historians such as William Carr, Gerhard Weinberg and Ian Kershaw have argued that one reason for Hitler's rush to war was his fear of an early death. He had repeatedly claimed that he must lead Germany into war before he got too old, as his successors might lack his strength of will. Hitler was concerned that a military attack against Poland could result in a premature war with Britain. Hitler's foreign minister and former ambassador to London, Joachim von Ribbentrop, assured him that neither Britain nor France would honour their commitments to Poland. Accordingly, on August 22, 1939 Hitler ordered a military mobilisation against Poland. This plan required tacit Soviet support, and the non-aggression pact between Germany and the Soviet Union, led by Joseph Stalin, included a secret agreement to partition Poland between the two countries. Contrary to Ribbentrop's prediction that Britain would sever Anglo-Polish ties, Britain and Poland signed the Anglo-Polish alliance on August 25, 1939. This, along with news from Italy that Mussolini would not honour the Pact of Steel, prompted Hitler to postpone the attack on Poland from August 25 to September 1. Hitler unsuccessfully tried to manoeuvre the British into neutrality by offering them a non-aggression guarantee on 25 August, he then instructed Ribbentrop to present a last-minute peace plan with an impossibly short time limit in an effort to blame the imminent war on British and Polish inaction. On September 1, 1939, Germany invaded western Poland under the pretext of having been denied claims to the free city of Danzig and the right to extraterritorial roads across the Polish corridor, which Germany had ceded under the Versailles Treaty. In response, Britain and France declared war on Germany on September 3, surprising Hitler and prompting him to angrily ask Ribbentrop, Now what? France and Britain did not act on their declarations immediately, and on September 17, Soviet forces invaded eastern Poland. The fall of Poland was followed by what contemporary journalists dubbed the phony war or Sitzkrieg. Hitler instructed the two newly appointed Gauleiters of northwestern Poland, Albert Forster of Reichsgau Danzig West Prussia and Arthur Grasser of Reichsgau Warthieland, 
to Germanis their areas, with no questions asked about how this was accomplished. In Forster's area, ethnic Poles merely had to sign forms stating that they had German blood. In contrast, Gracer agreed with Himmler and carried out an ethnic cleansing campaign towards Poles. Gracer soon complained that Forster was allowing thousands of Poles to be accepted as racial Germans and thus endangered German racial purity. Hitler refrained from getting involved. This inaction has been advanced as an example of the theory of working towards the Führer, in which Hitler issued vague instructions and expected his subordinates to work out policies on their own. Another dispute pitched one side represented by Heinrich Himmler and Grasser, who championed ethnic cleansing in Poland, against another represented by Göring and Hans Frank, who called for turning Poland into the granary of the Reich. On February 12, 1940, the dispute was initially settled in favor of the Göring-Frank view, which ended the economically disruptive mass expulsions. On May 15, 1940, Himmler issued a memo entitled Some Thoughts on the Treatment of Alien Population in the East, calling for the expulsion of the entire Jewish population of Europe into Africa and the reduction of the Polish population to a leaderless class of laborers. Hitler called Himmler's memo good and correct, and, ignoring Göring and Frank, implemented the himmler Grasser policy in Poland. On April 9, German forces invaded Denmark and Norway. On the same day Hitler proclaimed the birth of the Greater Germanic Reich, his vision of a united empire of Germanic nations of Europe in which the Dutch, Flemish and Scandinavians were joined into a racially pure polity under German leadership. In May 1940, Germany attacked France, and conquered Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and Belgium. These victories prompted Mussolini to have Italy join forces with Hitler on June 10. France and Germany signed an armistice on June 22. Kershaw notes that Hitler's popularity within Germany and German support for the war reached its peak when he returned to Berlin on July 6 from his tour of Paris. Following the unexpected swift victory, Hitler promoted 12 generals to the rank of field marshal during the 1940 field marshal ceremony. Britain, whose troops were forced to evacuate France by sea from Dunkirk, continued to fight alongside other British dominions in the Battle of the Atlantic. Hitler made peace overtures to the new British leader, Winston Churchill, and upon their rejection he ordered a series of aerial attacks on Royal Air Force air bases and radar stations in southeast England. On September 7 the systematic nightly bombing of London began. The German Luftwaffe failed to defeat the Royal Air Force in what became known as the Battle of Britain. By the end of September, Hitler realized that air superiority for the invasion of Britain could not be achieved, and ordered the operation postponed. The nightly air raids on British cities intensified and continued for months, including London, Plymouth, and Coventry. On September 27, 1940, the Tripartite Pact was signed in Berlin by Saburo Kurusu of Imperial Japan, Hitler, and Italian Foreign Minister Chano, and later expanded to include Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria, thus yielding the Axis powers. Hitler's attempt to integrate the Soviet Union into the anti-British bloc failed after inconclusive talks between Hitler and Molotov in Berlin in November and he ordered preparations for the invasion of the Soviet Union. In early 1941, German forces were deployed to North Africa, the Balkans, and the Middle East. In February, German forces arrived in Libya to bolster the Italian presence. In April, Hitler launched the invasion of Yugoslavia, quickly followed by the invasion of Greece. In May, 
German forces were sent to support Iraqi rebel forces fighting against the British and to invade Crete. On June 22, 1941, contravening the Hitler-Stalin non-aggression pact of 1939, four five million Axis troops attacked the Soviet Union. This offensive was intended to destroy the Soviet Union and seize its natural resources for subsequent aggression against the Western powers. The invasion conquered a huge area, including the Baltic Republics, Belarus and West Ukraine. By early August, Axis troops had advanced 500 kilometers and won the Battle of Smolensk. Hitler ordered Army Group Center to temporarily halt its advance to Moscow and divert its panzer groups to aid in the encirclement of Leningrad and Kiev. His generals disagreed with this change, having advanced within 400 kilometers of Moscow, and his decision caused a crisis among the military leadership. The pause provided the Red Army with an opportunity to mobilize fresh reserves. Historian Russell Stolfi considers it to be one of the major factors that caused the failure of the Moscow Offensive, which was resumed in October 1941 and ended disastrously in December. During this crisis, Hitler appointed himself as head of the Oberkommando des Heeres, at the same time limiting its authority to the Eastern Front. On December 7, 1941, Japan attacked the American fleet based at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Four days later, Hitler declared war against the United States. On December 18, 1941, Himmler asked Hitler, what to do with the Jews of Russia, to which Hitler replied, ALS partisan and Asuradan. Israeli historian Yehuda Bauer has commented that the remark is probably as close as historians will ever get to a definitive order from Hitler for the genocide carried out during the Holocaust. In late 1942, German forces were defeated in the Second Battle of El Alamein, thwarting Hitler's plans to seize the Suez Canal and the Middle East. Overconfident in his own military expertise following the earlier victories in 1940, Hitler became distrustful of his army high command and began to interfere in military and tactical planning, with damaging consequences. In December 1942 and January 1943, Hitler's repeated refusal to allow their withdrawal at the Battle of Stalingrad led to the almost total destruction of the Sixth Army. Over 200,000 Axis soldiers were killed and 235,000 were taken prisoner. Thereafter came a decisive strategic defeat at the Battle of Kursk. Hitler's military judgment became increasingly erratic and Germany's military and economic position deteriorated, as did Hitler's health. Following the Allied invasion of Sicily in 1943, Mussolini was removed from power by Victor Emmanuel III after a vote of no confidence of the Grand Council. Marshal Pietro Badoglio, placed in charge of the government, soon surrendered to the Allies. Throughout 1943 and 1944, the Soviet Union steadily forced Hitler's armies into retreat along the Eastern Front. On June 6, 1944, the Western Allied armies landed in northern France in one of the largest amphibious operations in history, Operation Overlord. Many German officers concluded that defeat was inevitable and that continuing under Hitler's leadership would result in the complete destruction of the country. Between 1939 and 1945, there were many plans to assassinate Hitler, some of which proceeded to significant degrees. The most well-known, the July 20 plot, came from within Germany and was at least partly driven by the increasing prospect of a German defeat in the war. In July 1944, in the July 20 plot, part of Operation Valkyrie, 
Klaus von Stauffenberg planted a bomb in one of Hitler's headquarters, the Wolf's Lair at Rassenberg. Hitler narrowly survived because staff officer Heinz Brandt moved the briefcase containing the bomb behind a leg of the heavy conference table, which deflected much of the blast. Later, Hitler ordered savage reprisals resulting in the execution of more than 4,900 people. By late 1944, both the Red Army and the Western Allies were advancing into Germany. Recognizing the strength and determination of the Red Army, Hitler decided to use his remaining mobile reserves against the American and British troops, which he perceived as far weaker. On December 16, he launched the Ardennes Offensive to incite disunity among the Western Allies and perhaps convince them to join his fight against the Soviets. The offensive failed after some temporary successes. With much of Germany in ruins in January 1945, Hitler spoke on the radio, however grave as the crisis may be at this moment, it will, despite everything, be mastered by our unalterable will. Hitler's hope to negotiate peace with the United States and Britain was encouraged by the death of U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt on April 12, 1945 but contrary to his expectations, this caused no rift among the Allies. Acting on his view that Germany's military failures meant it had forfeited its right to survive as a nation, Hitler ordered the destruction of all German industrial infrastructure before it could fall into Allied hands. Minister for Armaments Albert Speer was entrusted with executing this scorched-earth policy, but he secretly disobeyed the order. On April 20, his 56th birthday, Hitler made his last trip from the Fahrer bunker to the surface. In the ruined garden of the Reich Chancellery, he awarded iron crosses to boy soldiers of the Hitler Youth, who were now fighting the Red Army at the front near Berlin. By April 21, Georgi Zhukov's first Belarusian front had broken through the defences of General Gotthard Heinrichs Army Group Vistula during the Battle of the Silo Heights and advanced to the outskirts of Berlin. In denial about the dire situation, Hitler placed his hopes on the undermanned and under-equipped Army Tielung Steiner, commanded by Waffen-SS General Felix Steiner. Hitler ordered Steiner to attack the northern flank of the salient, while the German 9th Army was ordered to attack northward in a pincer attack. During a military conference on April 22, Hitler asked about Steiner's offensive. He was told that the attack had not been launched and that the Soviets had entered Berlin. Hitler asked everyone except Wilhelm Keitel, Alfred Jodl, Hans Krebs and Wilhelm Bergdorf to leave the room, then launched into a tirade against the treachery and incompetence of his commanders, culminating in his declaration for the first time that everything was lost. He announced that he would stay in Berlin until the end and then shoot himself. By April 23 the Red Army had surrounded Berlin and Goebbels made a proclamation urging its citizens to defend the city. That same day, Göring sent a telegram from Birch Teskeden, arguing that since Hitler was isolated in Berlin, Göring should assume leadership of Germany. Göring set a deadline, after which he would consider Hitler incapacitated. Hitler responded by having Göring arrested, and in his last will and testament, Written on April 29, he removed Goring from all government positions. On April 28 Hitler discovered that Himmler, who had left Berlin on April 20, was trying to negotiate a surrender to the Western Allies. He ordered Himmler's arrest and had Hermann Fiegelein shot. After midnight on April 29, Hitler married Eva Braun in a small civil ceremony in the Fahrer bunker. After a wedding breakfast with his new wife, Hitler dictated his will to his secretary Trottel Jung. 
The event was witnessed and documents signed by Krebs, Bergdorf, Goebbels, and Bormann. Later that afternoon, Hitler was informed of the execution of Mussolini, which presumably increased his determination to avoid capture. On April 30, 1945, when Soviet troops were within a block or two of the Reich Chancellery, Hitler shot himself in the head and Braun bit into a cyanide capsule. Their bodies were carried outside to the bombed-out garden behind the Reich Chancellery, where they were placed in a bomb crater and doused with petrol. The corpses were set on fire as the Red Army shelling continued. Grand Admiral Karl Dönitz and Joseph Goebbels assumed Hitler's roles as head of state and chancellor respectively. Berlin surrendered on May 2. Records in the Soviet archives obtained after the fall of the Soviet Union state that the remains of Hitler, Braun, Joseph, and Magda Goebbels, the six Goebbels children, General Hans Krebs, and Hitler's dogs were repeatedly buried and exhumed. On April 4, 1970, a Soviet KGB team used detailed burial charts to exhume five wooden boxes at the Smirsch facility in Magdeburg. The remains from the boxes were burned, crushed, and scattered into the Biedritz River, a tributary of the Elba. According to Kershaw, the corpses of Braun and Hitler were fully burned when the Red Army found them and only a lower jaw with dental work could be identified as Hitler's remains. If the international Jewish financiers in and outside Europe should succeed in plunging the nations once more into a world war, then the result will not be the Bolshevization of the earth, and thus the victory of Jewry, but the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe. The Holocaust and Germany's war in the East were based on Hitler's long-standing view that the Jews were the enemy of the German people and that Lebensraum was needed for Germany's expansion. He focused on Eastern Europe for this expansion, aiming to defeat Poland and the Soviet Union and then removing or killing the Jews and Slavs. The General Plan Ost called for deporting the population of occupied Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union to West Siberia, for use as slave labor or to be murdered, the conquered territories were to be colonized by German or Germanist settlers. The goal was to implement this plan after the conquest of the Soviet Union, but when this failed, Hitler moved the plans forward. By January 1942, he had decided that the Jews, Slavs, and other deportees considered undesirable should be killed. The genocide was organized and executed by Heinrich Himmler and Reinhard Heydrich. The records of the Wannsee Conference, held on January 20, 1942 and led by Heydrich, with 15 senior Nazi officials participating, provide the clearest evidence of systematic planning for the Holocaust. On February 22, Hitler was recorded saying, We shall regain our health only by eliminating the Jews. Similarly, at a meeting in July 1941 with leading functionaries of the Eastern Territories, Hitler said that the easiest way to quickly pacify the areas would be best achieved by shooting everyone who even looks odd. Although no direct order from Hitler authorizing the mass killings has surfaced, his public speeches, orders to his generals, and the diaries of Nazi officials demonstrate that he conceived and authorized the extermination of European Jewry. During the war, Hitler repeatedly stated his prophecy of 1939 was being fulfilled, namely, that a world war would bring about the annihilation of the Jewish race. Hitler approved the Einsatzgruppen killing squads that followed the German army through Poland, the Baltic, and the Soviet Union and was well informed about their activities. By summer 1942, Auschwitz concentration camp was expanded to accommodate large numbers of deportees for killing or enslavement. 
scores of other concentration camps and satellite camps were set up throughout Europe, with several camps devoted exclusively to extermination. Between 1939 and 1945, the Schutzestaffel, assisted by collaborationist governments and recruits from occupied countries, was responsible for the deaths of at least 11 million people, including 5.5 to 6 million Jews, and between 200,000 and 1,500,000 Romani people. Deaths took place in concentration and extermination camps, ghettos, and through mass executions. Many victims of the Holocaust were gassed to death, while others died of starvation or disease or while working as slave laborers. In addition to eliminating Jews, the Nazis planned to reduce the population of the conquered territories by 30 million people through starvation in an action called the Hunger Plan. Food supplies would be diverted to the German army and German civilians. Cities would be razed and the land allowed to return to forest or resettled by German colonists. Together, the Hunger Plan and General Plan Ost would have led to the starvation of 80 million people in the Soviet Union. These partially fulfilled plans resulted in additional deaths, bringing the total number of civilians and prisoners of war who died in the democide to an estimated 19.3 million people. Hitler's policies resulted in the killing of nearly 2 million non-Jewish Poles, over 3 million Soviet prisoners of war, communists and other political opponents, homosexuals, the physically and mentally disabled, Jehovah's Witnesses, Adventists, and trade unionists. Hitler did not speak publicly about the killings, and seems never to have visited the concentration camps. The Nazis embraced the concept of racial hygiene. On September 15, 1935, Hitler presented two laws known as the Nuremberg Laws to the Reichstag. The laws banned sexual relations and marriages between Aryans and Jews and were later extended to include gypsies, Negroes, or their bastard offspring. The law stripped all non-Aryans of their German citizenship and forbade the employment of non-Jewish women under the age of 45 in Jewish households. Hitler's early eugenic policies targeted children with physical and developmental disabilities in a program dubbed Action Brandt, and he later authorized a euthanasia program for adults with serious mental and physical disabilities, now referred to as Action T4. Hitler ruled the Enstap autocratically by asserting the Fara Prinzip. The principle relied on absolute obedience of all subordinates to their superiors, thus he viewed the government structure as a pyramid, with himself the infallible leader at the apex. Rank in the party was not determined by elections positions were filled through appointment by those of higher rank, who demanded unquestioning obedience to the will of the leader. Hitler's leadership style was to give contradictory orders to his subordinates and to place them into positions where their duties and responsibilities overlapped with those of others, to have the stronger one the job. In this way, Hitler fostered distrust, competition, and infighting among his subordinates to consolidate and maximize his own power. His cabinet never met after 1938 and he discouraged his ministers from meeting independently. Hitler typically did not give written orders, instead he communicated verbally, or had them conveyed through his close associate, Martin Bormann. He entrusted Bormann with his paperwork, appointments, and personal finances, Bormann used his position to control the flow of information and access to Hitler. Hitler dominated his country's war effort during World War II to a greater extent than any other national leader. He strengthened his control of the armed forces in 1938, and subsequently made all major decisions regarding Germany's military strategy. 
his decision to mount a risky series of offensives against Norway, France and the Low Countries in 1940 against the advice of the military proved successful, though the diplomatic and military strategies he employed in attempts to force the United Kingdom out of the war ended in failure. Hitler deepened his involvement in the war effort by appointing himself Commander-in-Chief of the Army in December 1941, from this point forward he personally directed the war against the Soviet Union, while his military commanders facing the Western Allies retained a degree of autonomy. Hitler's leadership became increasingly disconnected from reality as the war turned against Germany with the military's defensive strategies often hindered by his slow decision-making and frequent directives to hold untenable positions. Nevertheless, he continued to believe that only his leadership could deliver victory. In the final months of the war Hitler refused to consider peace negotiations, regarding the complete destruction of Germany as preferable to surrender. The military did not challenge Hitler's dominance of the war effort, and senior officers generally supported and enacted his decisions. For peace, freedom and democracy, never again fascism, millions of dead remind. Hitler's suicide was likened by contemporaries to a spell being broken. Public support for Hitler had collapsed by the time of his death and few Germans mourned his passing, Kershaw argues that most civilians and military personnel were too busy adjusting to the collapse of the country or fleeing from the fighting to take any interest. According to historian John Toland, National Socialism burst like a bubble without its leader. Hitler's actions and Nazi ideology are almost universally regarded as gravely immoral, according to Kershaw, never in history has such ruination physical and moral been associated with the name of one man. Hitler's political program brought about a world war, leaving behind a devastated and impoverished Eastern and Central Europe. Germany itself suffered wholesale destruction characterized as stunned and null. Hitler's policies inflicted human suffering on an unprecedented scale, according to R. J. Rummel, the Nazi regime was responsible for the democidal killing of an estimated 19.3 million civilians and prisoners of war. In addition, 29 million soldiers and civilians died as a result of military action in the European theater of World War II. The number of civilians killed during the Second World War was unprecedented in the history of warfare. Historians, philosophers and politicians often use the word evil to describe the Nazi regime. Many European countries have criminalized both the promotion of Nazism and Holocaust denial. Historian Friedrich Meinecke described Hitler as one of the great examples of the singular and incalculable power of personality in historical life. English historian Hugh Trevor Roper saw him as among the terrible simplifiers of history, the most systematic, the most historical, the most philosophical, and yet the coarsest, cruelest, least magnanimous conqueror the world has ever known. For the historian John M. Roberts, Hitler's defeat marked the end of a phase of European history dominated by Germany. In its place emerged the Cold War, a global confrontation between the Western Bloc, dominated by the United States and other NATO nations, and the Eastern Bloc, dominated by the Soviet Union. Historian Sebastian Hafner avers that without Hitler and the displacement of the Jews, the modern nation-state of Israel would not exist. He contends that without Hitler, the decolonization of former European spheres of influence would have been postponed. Further, Hafner claims that other than Alexander the Great, Hitler had a more significant impact than any other comparable historical figure in that he too caused a wide range of worldwide changes in a relatively short time span.
Hitler was born to a practicing Catholic mother and an anti-clerical father, after leaving home Hitler never again attended Mass or received the sacraments. Speer states that Hitler railed against the Church to his political associates and though he never officially left it, he had no attachment to it. He adds that Hitler felt that in the absence of organized religion, people would turn to mysticism, which he considered regressive. According to Speer, Hitler believed that Japanese religious beliefs or Islam would have been a more suitable religion for Germans than Christianity, with its meekness and flabbiness. Historian John S. Conway states that Hitler was fundamentally opposed to the Christian churches. According to Bullock, Hitler did not believe in God, was anti-clerical, and held Christian ethics in contempt because they contravened his preferred view of survival of the fittest. He favored aspects of Protestantism that suited his own views, and adopted some elements of the Catholic Church's hierarchical organization, liturgy, and phraseology. Hitler viewed the Church as an important politically conservative influence on society, and he adopted a strategic relationship with it that suited his immediate political purposes. In public, Hitler often praised Christian heritage and German Christian culture, though professing a belief in an Aryan Jesus who fought against the Jews. Any pro-Christian public rhetoric contradicted his private statements, which described Christianity as absurdity and nonsense founded on lies. According to a U.S. Office of Strategic Services report, the Nazi Master Plan, Hitler planned to destroy the influence of Christian churches within the Reich. His eventual goal was the total elimination of Christianity. This goal informed Hitler's movement early on, but he saw it as inexpedient to publicly express this extreme position. According to Bullock, Hitler wanted to wait until after the war before executing this plan. Speer wrote that Hitler had a negative view of Himmler's and Alfred Rosenberg's mystical notions and Himmler's attempt to mythologize the SS. Hitler was more pragmatic, and his ambitions centered on more practical concerns. Researchers have variously suggested that Hitler suffered from irritable bowel syndrome, skin lesions, irregular heartbeat, coronary sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, syphilis, giant cell arteritis, and tinnitus. In a report prepared for the OSS in 1943, Walter C. Langer of Harvard University described Hitler as a neurotic psychopath. In his 1977 book The Psychopathic God, Adolf Hitler, historian Robert G. L. Waite proposes that he suffered from borderline personality disorder. Historians Henrik Eberle and Hans Joachim Neumann consider that while he suffered from a number of illnesses including Parkinson's disease, Hitler did not experience pathological delusions and was always fully aware of and therefore responsible for, his decisions. Theories about Hitler's medical condition are difficult to prove, and placing too much weight on them may have the effect of attributing many of the events and consequences of Nazi Germany to the possibly impaired physical health of one individual. Kershaw feels that it is better to take a broader view of German history by examining what social forces led to the Nazi dictatorship and its policies rather than to pursue narrow explanations for the Holocaust and World War II based on only one person. Hitler followed a vegetarian diet. At social events he sometimes gave graphic accounts of the slaughter of animals in an effort to make his guests shun meat. Bormann had a greenhouse constructed near the Berghof to ensure a steady supply of fresh fruit and vegetables for Hitler. Hitler publicly avoided alcohol. He occasionally drank beer and wine in private, but gave up drinking because of weight gain in 1943. He was a non-smoker for most of his adult life, but smoked heavily in his youth. He eventually quit 
calling the habit a waste of money. He encouraged his close associates to quit by offering a gold watch to anyone able to break the habit. Hitler began using amphetamine occasionally after 1937 and became addicted to it in late 1942. Speer linked this use of amphetamine to Hitler's increasingly erratic behavior and inflexible decision-making. Bibliography Online Prescribed 90 medications during the war years by his personal physician, Theodore Morel, Hitler took many pills each day for chronic stomach problems and other ailments. He regularly consumed amphetamine, barbiturates, opiates, and cocaine, as well as potassium bromide and atropa belladonna. He suffered ruptured eardrums as a result of the July 20 plot bomb blast in 1944, and 200 wood splinters had to be removed from his legs. Newsreel footage of Hitler shows tremors in his left hand and a shuffling walk, which began before the war and worsened towards the end of his life. Ernst Gunter Skenk and several other doctors who met Hitler in the last weeks of his life also formed a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Hitler created a public image as a celibate man without a domestic life, dedicated entirely to his political mission and the nation. He met his lover, Eva Braun, in 1929, and married her in April 1945. In September 1931, his half-niece, Julie Robel, took her own life with Hitler's gun in his Munich apartment. It was rumored among contemporaries that Julie was in a romantic relationship with him, and her death was a source of deep, lasting pain. Paula Hitler, the younger sister of Hitler and the last living member of his immediate family, died in 1960. Hitler exploited documentary films and newsreels to inspire a cult of personality. He was involved and appeared in a series of propaganda films throughout his political career such as Der Sieg des Glaubens and Triumph des Willens made by Leni Riefenstahl, regarded as a pioneer of modern filmmaking.